my name is Tim Barfoot. I'm a professor at the Institute for Aerospace Studies here at the University of Toronto. Uh, I'm the principal investigator of the Autonomous Space Robotics Lab, and I'm also the associate director of the University of Toronto Robotics Institute. My research group works primarily on mobile robot navigation, and we can think of mobile robots as being a lot of different things these days. Everything from self-driving cars to unmanned aerial vehicles, mining vehicles, robots in hospitals, all kinds of different things. So we work primarily on the navigational aspects of that. So trying to get robots to navigate around cluttered dynamic environments uh, without hitting stuff um, and trying to get from one place to another. WinTOR is a research program that comes from the Ontario Research Fund Research Excellence Program. Uh, we have a number of professors here at the University of Toronto working on it, and it's focused on trying to bring uh, self-driving cars specifically to the challenges of the Canadian climate. So basically trying to make self-driving cars work in winter and other adverse weather conditions. Winter weather can affect many different aspects of driving a car. It can make what you see really complicated if you're driving in a snowstorm. Uh, but it can also make the road surface that you're driving on very slippery. And it also can affect how other drivers on the road are behaving. And so all of these things make the problem of making a car drive itself much more complicated. And so we've been trying to break that down into pieces. And my part of that is to work mainly on the solving the where is the car problem. So we call that localization. Um, and so we've been exploring uh, other types of sensors, for example. So normally self-driving cars will use cameras or laser rangefinder sensors to determine where they are on the road. Uh, but for us, we've been exploring the use of radar. And so radar has a longer wavelength, which means it can look through precipitation and it can start to see stuff uh, even, even when uh, humans can't see it with their eyes. You can see through that precipitation with radar. So on Wintour, uh, there's myself. Uh, Steve Waslander is the principal investigator of the whole project. So he, uh, he wrote the proposal and is uh, the captain of the team, I guess. Um, he's working more on front-end perception, so trying to process camera data specifically with uh, a machine learning approach to kind of be able to you know, figure out where the safe road is to drive on. Uh, if anyone's driven in a snowstorm, it's actually not even that easy to see the lines on the road. Uh, so he's been trying to decipher some of these problems uh, using machine learning. Uh, John Kelly is working on the project, um, working on aspects of planning and control. And then we have a couple of other professors from the University of Toronto at Mississauga, Igor Gilachinsky and Florian Shkurti, who are working on aspects of simulation, perception, planning, um, yeah, so there's a bunch of us. All the people that are working on self-driving basically are in the United States, or a lot of them are in the United States in sunny climates. And so uh, it's not, quote unquote, on their radar screen to think about how to drive in really bad weather. Uh, so it's quite important that we have this project in Canada. If we ever want to have self-driving cars here, uh, it's going to be us that has to solve these challenging weather scenarios. Uh, and I think the collaboration is important because these are some of the top experts in the country on robotics and self-driving cars, and we have quite a critical mass here. So the fact that we put this team together working on this problem is uh, is pretty unique, and we hope to uh, we hope to accomplish quite a bit by the end of the five years. So what is state estimation? It's basically the process of trying to determine key quantities uh, that describe how a robot exists in the world. So it's position. It's orientation in the world. Those are the states of the of the robot. And so it can be quite challenging because uh, the data is usually typically very noisy. There can be a lot of outliers. So some of the data is just corrupted and you have to have algorithms that are able to look at all of that noisy, corrupted data and sort of throw away the bad parts and keep only the good parts uh, in order to produce an estimate the state. I think state estimation is very exciting because it has a lot of theoretical roots. So we can actually start from mathematics equations. I really like the math behind a lot of the algorithms in robotics. And we can go all the way through to something that actually is very practical in the world. I can go from equations to a car driving around Toronto and show that my algorithms actually work. When we're studying different aspects of robotics, uh, localization, mapping, planning, control, these are basically the fundamental building blocks of robotics. And, and the reason we kind of look at those things from a research point of view is that they can be adapted very easily to a lot of different applications. So whether you're working in self-driving cars in the winter, 
mining vehicles, robots driving down a hallway in a hospital, they all have these common challenges of localization. You know, where is the robot mapping? What does the environment look like? Planning, how do I get from one place to another and control? How do I react to things that are, that are maybe like messing up my plan? So I think it's fundamentally important for companies to invest in university research. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that I think a lot of the really fundamental technologies do originate on the university side of the fence. Um, if you look at what's going on today with self-driving cars, the fundamental building blocks of robotics, localization, mapping, planning, control, all these things were developed over decades on the university side of the fence. And now that those things exist, companies have matured to the point where they can take those building blocks and assemble them into working systems and try to turn them into profitable industries. Uh, but if that initial work had not been invested in over those decades, there would be very little for them to be working with at this point. And then the second part of the answer is that by having companies invest in universities, they get to really help develop the next generation of engineers and computer scientists who will come and work at those companies. So robotics has had a long history uh, in Canada. So we worked, uh, we got involved in the CanadaArm uh, program very early in the 1970s, which is a major contribution from the Canadian Space Agency uh, to that program. Um, five manipulators were built um, and since have been retired. CanadaArm2 serves on the International Space Station and Canada's building uh, robots for the new Lunar Gateway Station, so CanadaArm3. Uh, but robotics has expanded to many different areas These since those early programs. Uh, we talked about some of those things, mining, agriculture, self-driving cars, unmanned aerial vehicles, all these different things. These are industries that are just uh, ready to explode as new applications, profitable applications of robotics. And so... Uh, like many different countries around the world, uh, we're trying to think about what is the role of robotics and how will it help shape the future of Canada. The University of Toronto Robotics Institute aims to kind of solidify Canada's position in robotics uh, for the future. One of the things that we've been doing and that we helped uh, found from the University of Toronto Robotics Institute was we were one of the co-founders of a new uh, organization called the Canadian Robotics Council, which is a partnership between government, academia, and industrial uh, stakeholders uh, in robotics. And so they've come together to form this really interesting new organization that's trying to roadmap out how some of these different technologies could move out into the world. And what we hope is that's going to sort of form a blueprint or a national robotics strategy around how uh, Canada can maintain its leadership position in robotics for the long term. Um, we have many different pockets of robotics happening across the university, from aerospace to uh, medical to manufacturing, many different applications. And so what the Robotics Institute represents for us here at the university is basically it's a community building exercise. It's the glue that sticks all of these different robotics aspects together. It's important because these different applications don't work in isolation. So there are many common building blocks and problems that we can talk about across robotics that can benefit from one another. So we don't need to work on aerospace robotics separately from medical robotics. And so what we want to do with the RI is bring the research together in this community kind of forum, offer different seminars, um, and basically provide a really rich learning environment for all of the students who are now studying robotics and hope to head off into industry and help Canada uh, maintain its position in robotics for the long term. If I had to describe robotics research at the University of Toronto in a single word, feature enabling. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs>